thank you, Edmonton, for this terrific invitation to come back um, for many reasons. One, I actually got to meet Mayor Iveson in person. We encountered each other recently uh, on the Sunday edition with Michael Enright, and it was a great pleasure to have that conversation. And uh, now that I've seen him in action, uh, <laughs> He's living up to his reputation as a great city builder and problem solver. No, seriously, um, we in Ontario look with envy at Alberta because you have two of the most progressive, most urban-oriented mayors in the country, and, and you're doing great things. And one, one of the the best things you get to do in my line of work is to go back and see how things turn out. And my great colleague and mentor, Jane Jacobs, with whom I enjoyed a 40-year relationship, always used to say, I'm so curious. I just want to know what happens next. And coming back to Edmonton after a couple of years, as Peter said, and seeing all the progress and feeling the energy. Um, is really quite inspiring. So what I want to talk about tonight is what role design plays in a great collective project that we are all involved in, which is the transformation of the city, the perpetually unfinished city, but with a new set of challenges. And to position where we are now, you really have to look back to what happened just before uh, and after the Second World War. And so on the left, you see Edmonton's downtown, very, very near to where we are this evening. Uh, it was compact, it was dense, it was pedestrian-oriented, it was mixed use. It had all of the characteristics that we talk about today when we speak of sustainable cities. On the right, you see an image of the great diorama, the Futurama Pavilion that was created at the 1939 uh, World's Fair uh, in which General Motors participated. And what that was really about was selling a way of life facilitated or enabled by the automobile, but one in which all of that concentration, that compression, what happened on that Dutch intersection that Peter was talking about was all blown apart and we spread out over the countryside. We separated every function, everything we did in life from everything else and connected them with automobile trips. And we are now in recovery mode. Um, what happened very quickly, and you see that Life magazine cover from 1960 on the left, is the highways filled up as quickly as we built them. It was, that was Dwight Eisenhower, the interstate highway program in the U.S., 46,000 miles of them that became the conduits to lead people out of cities. Uh, we did something to the atmosphere that we didn't begin to understand until much later. We're now faced, of course, with climate change. We precipitated a public health crisis. We had no idea at the time what such an inactive lifestyle would do in terms of hypertension, diabetes, obesity, uh, heart disease, especially in children. And we're seeing that now um, in a very, very significant way. And finally, on the right, a little shout out to Alberta and your premier, because you have taken a huge step for which I think everyone in Canada is very grateful um, to really acknowledging that we have to move off fossil fuel dependence. We have to diversify our economy. We have to look to other energy sources. We have to, in a word, become more sustainable and more responsible. So there's a huge reaction. And I call this round two. If round one was what happened right after World War II, which transformed the urban landscape, we're now transforming it again in a kind of reverse engineering not exactly going back to any previous state, but going forward to something else. And that is essentially what this book is about. It's a chronology of personal experiences, because I realized when I was writing the book that I lived this. 
My parents, my aunts, uncles were the generation of people who moved out of the city. Um, I went through all those stages and, and the return to the city. So it's a combination of sort of the professional aspect of it, but also the personal and lived aspect of it. And what we have come to now is something which can be seen in a generational shift that is very, very powerful, which is the changing nature of what we refer to as the American dream, or I'll call it the North American dream, which is kind of symbolized by that image on the left. It was the idea of owning a piece of property, having a car, which eventually became a fleet of cars for every adult in the household, which would get you from place to place. And if, if you possess that and all of the uh, things that filled up that house, that was success. Well, we're now at a point where the a younger generation and the younger you go, the more pervasive this is, define success completely differently. And their version of the North American dream is to live in a neighborhood where you can walk to buy your groceries and all the other things that go along with that. And this is showing up, this new desire, this new definition of success is showing up on all kinds of radar screens. This one is a publication from 2013 that the Urban Land Institute, probably the most prestigious organization of developers put out for their membership, pointing out that that blue um, set of lines on the chart, which is the quest for walkability, either people moving back into city centers or into inner suburbs that possess walkability or places in suburbs that have walkability, it just keeps growing. And what's shrinking is the desire where people have the choice for that auto-oriented lifestyle. Uh, this is a study by the Pembina Institute, um, which operates in Ontario, which looked at uh, consumer preferences for different types of living arrangements, and they looked at age, they looked at home size, they looked at numbers of children, and what they were finding in every single one of those categories is that people were desiring to make a trade-off living in smaller spaces if they did not have to have long commutes and if they had that kind of convenience. Very, very pervasive trend. Um, these are even more interesting. These are from The Economist, and they're showing two things. On the left, something called demotorization, where the number of kilometers traveled annually in most countries in the developed world is actually going down by automobile we pass the peak and it's now decreasing. Even more spectacular on the right is the propensity to get driver's licenses. And there are two, there are two uh, lines. In light blue is 1983, and in the darker blue is 2010. Well, when I was 16 years old, the first thing I wanted to do was get a license. Everybody did. The very moment you could get a license, because that was liberation, that was freedom, having wheels, as we used to say. Um, what, now what those charts show is that in North America, between age 16 and age 34, 26% of that group do not have driver's licenses. And many of them have no intention of getting them. A really remarkable change that's going on. And in fact, as you get younger and younger, and I don't count myself in that young cohort, but this is mobility. It's having this device in your pocket and that's how you navigate the world and that's how you connect with people. So it's a very, very different set of user preferences. On the lower right is something called walk score, uh, which if you haven't looked at, I would encourage you to do. And when people are deciding where to live or where to open a business, they open up walk score that happens to be Vancouver. And you can see all the things you can do and access within a five minute walk of, where you, of any address that you enter. That's a very crucial thing now for people. So what's happening is that cities across North America are going through an amazing change, transforming in this way. This is a very complicated 
multifaceted process. Uh, some of the things we deal with in making the change are internal to a city, some are externalities. Every city is a little different and goes through this in its own way. But to bring design into the equation, every aspect of this transformation touches on some aspect of design. Not design as an aesthetic overlay after all the fundamental decisions have been made, but design as fundamental problem solving. And this is happening in city regions. So this, this is the um, zooming out from the greater Toronto Hamilton city region um, in its context. Um, we in that city region, like most, and I would guess probably yours as well, 80% of us have ended up living in auto-oriented suburbs. So that can't be ignored. It's not just the transformation of the city center, it's what ha what's happening in those suburbs. So we have these two parallel phenomena, which I have been working on for all of my career. One of them on the left is the infill of the city partially abandoned, part partially destroyed as a result of the exodus through urban renewal and so on. And that's the St. Lawrence neighborhood in Toronto around the St. Lawrence market for you, those of you who know the city where when I was working on that under David Crombie, um, about 75% of that land area was surface parking lots. And it's now all been filled in by a, an incredibly vibrant mixed neighborhood, mixed income, mixed use. On the right, a more recent project, Bank Street in Ottawa, but not the part of Bank Street that has been so successful in downtown, the part on the south side of the Ottawa River, which essentially is a suburban arterial with strip malls and power centers. And what's interesting there is when I got involved in this, at the request of the local councillors, the landowners, the business owners, and the residents, uh, the city asked for a plan to transform the artery itself, the transportation side, but also to transform the land use and build form so that the people living in those houses could actually do what the mayor was describing, which is walk to things and transform those parking lots into mixed use, multi-story development uh, serving a variety of functions. So there are major challenges. I mentioned the externalities, economic, environmental, social, and political. And so I've come up with this ideogram to describe everything that's involved here because everything is connected to everything else. The key enablers here are governance, obviously political leadership, such as you have in your city, you're very fortunate to have. Um, resources, how we decide to use our resources, and how we structure our decision making. So the decision that the mayor just described in terms of the committee structure is absolutely crucial. Because if you don't have people thinking about those issues in the same place, then you're not able to achieve the kind of integration that's necessary. So here's a number of design challenges. Um, one of them is embracing mix and diversity. And that touches on land use planning, but it also gets down to how we make buildings and how we make blocks and how we make neighborhoods. Changing how we move in the city. Um, expanding the commons, the public spaces, the public realm that we share. Seeing ourselves as part of nature in the cities in a period when we're challenged by climate change and extreme events, and pulling all of these things together to play chords, not single notes. So this is the St. Lawrence neighborhood in Toronto, which was an early example of doing a really successful mixed income neighborhood right on the shoulder of downtown, and creating a neighborhood, neighborhood building, city district building, is a very, very significant problem which includes all aspects of design. Um, changing how we move, we now have a problem of success in Toronto, but a very serious problem in that we've, we're adding over 100,000 people a year, most of whom are coming into downtown Toronto, and we've inherited this very inadequate 
street system based on one chain, 66 feet or 20 meters, the railway chain, and we have so many people on the sidewalks, we have so many cyclists, so many people trying to use transit vehicles, um, that everybody has become a bit cranky and a bit annoyed because you can't get around, and we have to change things. We have to get more people out of their cars in order to make this work. We have to avail ourselves of all these new and very old high-tech and low-tech uh, devices available to us from the bicycle, which has become a really serious form of transportation, sharing bicycles, sharing cars, uh, looking forward to the role of automated vehicles, which will actually ease some of this congestion, but also using those devices that we have um, in order to navigate the system in real time. So my son who lives in Tokyo with his phone has access to trains, to subways, to taxis, to every form of transportation. In Hong Kong you have the octopus card, which is a cash card that does pretty much all of that. And you can, we're getting to the point of total fare integration and having information about all of those ways of getting around accessible to us. Um, as a, another design aspect of this problem is putting streets back together. We blew streets apart and we created a profession um, dedicated only to traffic engineering. And in fact, all of the best traffic engineers no longer call themselves traffic engineers, they're calling themselves transportation engineers. And they're saying they're looking at all modes of travel, including pedestrian, cycling, transit, uh, as well as wheeled vehicles. So this is from Ottawa, where they're introducing a new LRT in downtown. And we did a study, that's Queen Street, where as the LRT comes in, we go from the image on the top to the image on the bottom. So widen the sidewalks, a whole level of street furniture, uh, treating transit users in a more civilized way, um, getting closer to that Amsterdam intersection that Peter was describing. Uh, we have inherited all this mid 20th century highway infrastructure in our cities. This is Montreal and Toronto, the problem of falling concrete that you're aware of. We've had bridges collapse. This, this is a big, big issue. How do we deal with that? Do we put it back the way it was? Or do we, as a hundred cities around the world have now done, take the opportunity, the obsolescence of that infrastructure to do something different? We have this extraordinary problem of extreme events precipitated by climate change. You'll of course recognize the stampede grounds in Calgary in 2013. Um, this is a major, major design issue. I'm currently working on the first new master plan for the city of Boston in 50 years, and one of the most significant issues is sea level rise and how that will affect that coastal city. And this will require extraordinary measures, but it also creates extraordinary opportunities in the form of creating new public spaces as we change our relationship to those bodies of water and to the um, systems that feed them. We, in fact, are being forced um, to rethink our relationship with nature. Um, Peter evoked Frederick Law Olmsted. Frederick, many of Frederick Law Olmsted's greatest parks were actually drainage systems. He was thinking about the city as a living instrument. They weren't just decorative spaces. They weren't just spaces for recreation. They were working landscapes. So getting back to that idea. Uh, in terms of the public realm, we in Canada are extraordinarily privileged to live in one of the few places that I know of in the world where people from all parts of the globe actually have figured out a way to live together in relative peace and harmony. And we must never take that for granted. And part of that, the success, is that we share sidewalks, we share streets, we share parks, we have places where we come together. And so to continue to expand and maintain and use those spaces in a way where we feel comfortable with each other 
is extremely important. Um, Winter City, which the mayor mentioned, we, uh, these, these are from Stockholm, another Winter City, but to make a city where all of those things we do in winter are part of the life of the city on a daily basis through all seasons. So we're not only thinking of public spaces in those months of summer or spring or fall. So all of this has to be thought of together, not one thing at a time, but how these things interact with each other and across a whole gamut of scales from the city region to the city in the region, to the neighborhood, to the block, and ultimately to the building. And all of these have a physical design component which is related to the scale above and the scale below. So this is um, a new kind of map of the Greater Toronto Hamilton area where three important provincial policies are portrayed in a physical way. So we have the green belt, we have places to grow, and I don't know how well you can see that, but all of those yellow circles represent growth areas that have been identified, and they are wired to the third important provincial plan, and all of this is legislated, called the Big Move. And this is a combination of commuter trains, light rail, bus rapid transit, and for the first time, we're now working on, so the complete integration of all those plans at the city region scale. So Mayor, you were talking about integrating land use and transportation within the city. This is acknowledging that this is a regional issue. It's not contained within one municipal boundary. But what's really important is that people generally, this has become popularized so that this map is not just a map that's understood by specialists, but people in the GTA, the GTHA, actually know where the Oak Ridges Moraine is now, they know where the escarpment is, they know where the watersheds are. They understand that we live in that natural setting. So then you go down one scale, and I know you're gonna have Jennifer Kiesmet, um, our chief planner, come to be the next speaker in the series, this is her territory. This is the amalgamated city of Toronto. And so this is the next version down, the nesting boxes of a plan that shows um, a structure plan for the city where density is being directed to the transportation corridors, to the rail, to the um, LRT, streetcars, uh, to the bus stops, to the subways, and areas of soft sites, uh, obsolescent areas, those arterials that can be densified have been identified as well as areas to be protected. So there's a kind of integration happening at that scale as well, also a design problem. And this is from a, a venture that's currently undergoing called Eglinton Connects, new LRT going across Eglinton Avenue. And here you see all of those elements coming together. You see the transformation of the street, you see new mixed use buildings, and that is wired by the new major investment through the big move through Metrolinx in the transportation infrastructure. And then you get down to a corridor, and this is an active transportation corridor following the rail northwest out of the downtown where uh, something called the West Toronto Rail Path, which was actually began as a community initiative, is now being extended all the way from Weston or the junction, if you know the geography, right to downtown Toronto. And so all the communities along that, these are people who are cycling, essentially, will also have access to a kind of cycling highway that will lead into downtown, similar to what's happening in Copenhagen and Amsterdam and cities in Europe. And then in suburban areas, we're seeing the same kind of thing happen. This is Markham Center, uh, and pretty much every community in the 905 has a plan like the one you see here, where you can see transit in the lower left coming in, bus rapid transit, was, which is being directed right through the heart of this center. Uh, this was actually uh, a project that I worked on, which is bringing a new campus of York University right on the GO train 
sitting in the middle of this center, but also orchestrating through design the introduction of mixed use and built form and uh, exploiting uh, a major green system along a river that runs right through the heart of the center. So it has the DNA of all the things that I've been describing. Um, you get down to a neighborhood scale, and as all that density comes in, this is the King Spadina area, just the west side of downtown, what's emerging, and you'll see this come back again when I talk about one of the projects within it, is as all this population increases, going to that theme of the common ground, the public realm, creating a whole set of interlinked and improved green spaces with all of the amenities that go along with that so that every increment of development actually brings an increment of connected green space that ties to the others. And then down one more scale, and this is the block, and this is an interesting phenomenon. We're starting to see joint ventures of developers. And in this case, we have a major office developer, a major retail developer, and a major residential developer teaming up to do this block plan of seven small pedestrian blocks on a seven acre site wired with a pedestrian network, but where every building on the site actually contains mixed use. And so this, this is the future. This, this is where we're heading. So that, that same, from the regional scale right down to this scale, the same themes are playing out as design themes. And now taking it down one more scale further to an individual building project, which I worked on with a great developer called the Daniels Corporation. This is kind of something called the City of the Arts, where on that site will be um, residential, both rental and condo, including affordable housing, but also office space, uh, a faculty of a university, um, art space with a launch pad for a thousand visual artists sharing studio space, a component of the music industry, and of course the retail, the cafe, the public spaces that they will all share. So this embrace, this embrace of radical mixed use at a really fine grain, going back to what older cities achieved. I'll go back to that image of Edmonton um, that I showed you right to start. We're coming at that again in a new way. So now I'm just gonna take you through a few projects that illustrate these points that I've been privileged to work on. One is the Lower Don River, where the Don River comes into Toronto Harbor and where we had a big flood proofing problem. And the city had started off by assigning different tasks to different groups in silos. So there was one group that was of engineers working on flood proofing. Uh, these were done through environmental assessments. Another that was working on introducing municipal services and utilities. A third that was looking at introducing light rail transportation. A fourth that was looking at development. A fifth that was looking at creating parks. And the city decided, seeing a camel being produced, decided to call a timeout, called in Waterfront Toronto and said, let's make this a design competition that actually all of these problems are highly interrelated. They need to be joined at the hip. And so they staged an international design competition. And I was on a team with my colleague, Michael Van Valkenburg, great landscape architect from New York and Cambridge and our team actually won that competition. And what we did is we turned the flood proofing solution into an estuary of the Don River, a 100 acre park system in which the river could expand and contract in periods of flooding with three different channels for the river, but also the heart of a new neighborhood and dealt with all of the different aspects that went into that and that led to a solution that worked its way right up the river valley, connecting to other new neighborhoods. So the Don Valley moves from what Torontonians used to think of when they said the Don Valley was a, a congested highway to now understanding that the Don Valley is actually a valley and bringing it back. And so to make this happen, and this has been the most exciting change, I have to say, in my professional life, This this is, how we worked on that, that's, that's the table, the round table 
where I am there with colleagues who are architects, many different kinds of engineers, ecologists, economists, artists, social providers, working in a team setting, which is very much like the kind of discussion I was having today with city staff, people with all those skills actually collaborating on finding a design solution which none of us could have found on our own. That's the key thing. No individual profession has a monopoly on the knowledge that would enable the kind of solution that we came up with. And there's also a commitment here to engage the public in these transformations in new and innovative ways because this is not insider baseball. This is something that belongs to everybody. And unless you have the public support, you're just not gonna get to the outcomes you're looking for. So what is going on in Toronto now, which people have only begun to understand, is a huge multi-generational undertaking that is going beyond any single political administration. In fact, it's been going on, depending on how you want to count it, probably for about 30 years, and involves really extraordinary community stewardship. And that community stewardship was called upon to recently turn back an expansion of jets at Billy Bishop Airport successfully. And we've seen the outcome in the last federal election to turn back a mega casino proposal, to turn back a fantasy of Doug Ford's, uh, Rob Ford's brother, to hijack that lower dawn plan and bring in um, an Australian developer uh, through a backdoor method to turn that into a a luxury yacht club and uh, a mega mall. Uh, the community has ownership of this and is overseeing this transformation such that it can't be hijacked. Um, here's a new project that I'm currently working on. This was another competition um, that my team won. This is with KPMB Architects and with West 8 from Rotterdam. And the competition was for a new ferry terminal and for a park at Harbor Square um, right in the heart of the city, the foot of Young and Bay. Uh, this was done in the 1970s. It was pretty miserable. It's totally inadequate for the use of the ferry now. And so our big idea, which was a design idea, was to, instead of having a building in a park, to create one thing called Harbor Landing, which was a fusion of architecture and landscape uh, in which we had a situation where the park actually extended right over the roof of the ferry terminal, enabling people to move freely through the entire site and which was wired back to all the promenades along the water and to Queens Quay, which has been transformed. So we are currently um, working on that project. Oops. It's uh, jammed. I don't know if there's somebody back there who can move the slide. Oh, here we go. So there you see it, and um, this is something the public completely resonated with. We're currently working with a stakeholder advisory committee, a technical advisory committee, um, and moving forward with the first phase of this project in the next year. I think I'll have to get you to advance the slides. This, I don't know if, okay, here's. So there you see a view of that coming down Bay Street and what you're seeing in front of you is actually the ferry terminal and you can go right up on top of it on a beautiful promontory overlooking the lake. Next. These are just some sections through which shows that integration of landscape and building. And I, I'm showing these in a little more detail because it's only through collaborative design, actually getting architects and landscape architects and engineers to work together that you can arrive at this kind of solution. Next. Again, the theme of winter. Uh, this obviously works in one way in summer when everybody's heading for Toronto Island, but it also creates an environment that can be inhabited in winter. Next. Okay, one, go back one, okay. Uh, one more which is Regent Park. This is a big social issue, one of the largest and oldest public housing projects in Toronto, um, in a terrible state. Go ahead one. 
1947, this is how we thought about housing low-income people. And I'm sure you have examples of this in your city. This is what was being done all across North America and around the world. It was pretty miserable, too. Giant super blocks. No one else ever had any reason to go there. People were completely isolated. Next. And this, this is the way it ended up, and with a lot of very serious social problems, but at the same time, a really strong sense of community, which I discovered when I began to work with this neighborhood in 2002. Next. So we hammered out with the community some principles, and the key finding was their desire to be a neighborhood like any other neighborhood, to no longer be isolated and part of this was also a, a strategy of funding this by more than doubling the population and making this a mixed income neighborhood as opposed to uh, an area only for rent geared to income housing. Next. So this is the really simple plan that we came up with which was no more than just extending all the streets from the surrounding community going back to something that had actually was not unlike what had been there previously, but obviously at much higher densities, bringing shopping into the community, creating jobs in the community, all the things that had been missing, um, as well as things for the larger community to use. Next, please. So this, as a design problem, it's not just about the physical design. There's a social development plan, a sustainability plan, tenant relocation plan, which is absolutely critical. And all these things have to be orchestrated together for this to be successful. Next. And um, I had to take my licks sometimes in these community meetings. We had whispering translation in seven languages, which was quite amazing. And what we found was, and I'm, I wasn't surprised but what drew everybody together, people from very different parts of the world coming with very different experiences, was the idea of living in a green, sustainable, and walkable neighborhood. That was something that everyone resonated with. Uh, we hired high school kids from all the different groups who would go and sit at kitchen tables and talk to people and be translators and come back to our meetings and help people express their views. And it was a very inspiring experience. Next. So that's how the plan uh, kind of evolved. It was a mix of different types of housings. The, despite the fact that it had been called Regent Park, there was never a park there. There were only parking lots and spaces between the buildings. So we actually introduced a major six-acre park, a new park around of almost the same size around Nelson Mandela School and connected those spaces. Next. Uh, back one. Key to this was a set of urban design guidelines and the commitment working with a master developer was to hire some of the best architects in the city, different architects for every building so it wouldn't be institutional, some of the best landscape architects, some through competition, some through uh, a selection process and we established a very simple regime of design guidelines that were uh, flexible at the same time, some very strong orientations Two streets, two parks, two relationships, next. And what has been crucial was a design review panel created in 2005, and I'm still part of that panel. It's all volunteers, and we review with Toronto Community Housing every single building project that comes along to its betterment. Next. And these, these were the terms of reference. Um, and we've had, in addition to designers, we've had tenant representatives, we've had people from the city, uh, we've had people from the housing corporation, all sitting together. Again, this theme of convergence and people bringing these many different points of view to the review of the projects. This, this was the first piece to be built and it contained the DNA of the entire project. So in the foreground, you see a condo building. In the background, you see two forms of assisted housing, one for families, one for seniors. 
And very importantly, right in the foreground is a major grocery store and a bank and a Tim Hortons. And I'm not the biggest fan of Tim Hortons, but I love this Tim Hortons. Because all of these establishments employ young people from the community. They've trained them, they've gotten the jobs, and so this really belongs to everybody. And having that grocery store appear there where there had been no services at all was incredibly important. And there's a big model of the site that everybody can come and see each step along the way. Uh, there's the lobby of one of the new buildings. These buildings are in immaculate condition. People are so proud of them. There are, uh, in the ground floors of the buildings, there are areas for playgrounds for kids, indoor and outdoor, uh, computer rooms for the teenagers, a whole variety of things that uh, serve this community. Next. So what has happened is that one thing has led to another, and many things that we could never have imagined have come along to join in this plan. So we now have an aquatic center that is the best swimming pool in Toronto. Uh, we have a cricket pitch that is co-funded with Maple Leaf Sports. Uh, we have a community radio station and places where young people are producing videos and TV. Um, just any number of things that have come along. Next. This is something called the Spectrum um, 16,000 square feet of, 60,000 square feet, excuse me, of dynamite, where community organizations of all kinds, including a Center for Social Innovation, uh, many um, artistic companies, all kinds of things are actually sharing this space, a great restaurant, a jazz bar, all in the heart of this community where outsiders never came before. And these are just some images of a day in the life. There's the Tim Hortons on the right, the swimming pool, a pedestrian street right in the heart of the community for festivals. Next. And this, this is one of my favorite quotes from Jane Jacobs. The best plans are the plans that liberate other people's plans. And that is exactly what has happened here. Next. Now, I'm going to show you a video. It's a very short video, but I think you'll enjoy it. This was made by a collaboration between that young man who was 15 years old at the time, a young poet named Mustafa, and a jazz musician named Thomas Egbo Egbo, who was originally from Nigeria, who grew up in Regent Park. Manifest and your find open And not just your eyes To depict the beauty in the park Often sheltered in lies Looking to find a place to shelter Artistic minds to grasp the talents Unheard, talent they Blurred, talent they left behind To replace with breaking news Of breaking hearts And rap with caution Take time and time And time again If only they knew the park is true Hearts that beat for each other has just been redefined But as it redesigns, the beating will be clear and recombined Emphatic, roaring, peace of heart, peace of mind Peace of heart, pieces intertwined As it redesigns, it will show the bright colors Splattered against brick walls, down with tears Colors that come alive when light skies disappear Then let the art touch your heart, art, heart Children that sing louder than gunshots Sounds that ring louder than sirens Echoing through the park Through Somali tongues to the music Into Egypt Park School of Music 
lifting parts of broken hearts out of fear. Voices that empower the touch, not the skin, but what lies in here. So hear, but not just with your ears. To listen to the stories of stories I've been left unclear. Open the doors to Regent Park's film festival. Lights, cameras, and reactions. Golden spots of interaction. Lights, cameras, and attractions from all parts of the city. All we asked for was your heart and not your pity. All we asked for was your heart and not your pity. Be the change in the center of a social innovation. Watch every office turn into a foundation of inspiration. Hot desks of motivation as they smoothen the glow. Watch the new world unfold from youth engagement to poverty. Watch veiled eyes unroll. Your mind, clear your mind before you enter native art performing arts. Let the soles of your feet feel our mother's breaths in the ground as friction makes a sound resounding. Nature's gifts abounding. Feel as they teach spiritual fundamentals. Native arts main credentials is the earth we live on. So celebrating their culture should be essential. And that. Since Cobra's open doors, West African style. Let the beat of the drums harmonize with the beat of your soul and let it travel miles. And even, and even if you're spiritually drained as you dance, as you dance, just smile. Smile till you can forget sadness and laugh at anger. Until you can look into the eyes of anyone as a future brother and not a stranger. Invest in relationships. You don't need to be a banker. Send your salams to a Muslim. Go play dice with a gangster. Redefine stereotypes and send that. Send that to the news anchor. Don't judge anyone. It's a small world, and we're all neighbors. See everyone as one. Let that be our new culture, along with our own, and let us hone a new art of hearts that have grown. Once close to every chance, now an opportunity to enhance from a spectrum of open gates. Experience, learn, and innovate. So almost done, but I'm going to show you now one of the, not that this project wasn't extraordinary, but another one of the most extraordinary projects I've ever been involved in, which is a project for the underside of the Gardner Expressway for about two kilometers on the west side of downtown through a remarkable $25 million private donation that has just come forward. And if we could go to the next. There's a little one minute video and I'm gonna keep my fingers crossed. It's the one on the top and hopefully uh, this will give you an idea of what this is about. What you see there, I'll just describe it. That's Fort York right in the foreground, the original shoreline of Toronto, the Gardner Expressway, the elevated expressway that came through in mid 20th century. And here it comes.
Okay, so this, we just launched this last week um, with the mayor, with Waterfront Toronto, which is going to be the implementing agency. I'm acting as the client representative on this for the Matthews couple, Judy and Will, who are the donors. And what this does, you can see, you know, the, the, the dark red line, the thick red line is the where the $25 million will essentially be spent, but all those other links are either existing or coming. So this actually wires together all of those neighborhoods. Next. And this is where in the last 15 years or so, about 70,000 new residents have come to live in high-rise neighborhoods, which are somewhat isolated, lacking in public space, separated from each other, and separated from the nearby waterfront. So this becomes the shared living room for all of these new residents. Next. And it's possible, and that this is a wonderful piece of serendipity, because the city is currently spending $150 million restoring the deck of the expressway in this area on an accelerated schedule, which will finish in 2016. And so the condition of the gift when we went to the mayor and to Waterfront Toronto was that we would provide the $25 million on the condition that we could immediately follow that restoration. And so this space will be opened in July 2017 as a sesquicentennial project. So the city is acting at a speed that has never been seen before. We have the collaboration of about 30 senior staff in all the departments to make this happen. Next. Uh, can't see that. Those are the contracts uh, for the restoration. Next. And these are some examples, smaller versions of this that have been done in other places in the world from Mission Bay to the Netherlands to the UK. Um, that we used as part of the presentation to the mayor, next. And so what we have in mind is to create a great cultural space in the heart of the city in 55 rooms that are formed by what are called the bents, which are the columns and the beams, uh, in which we will invite all of the significant cultural producers in Toronto from major things like First Night and Luminato, uh, to come, but also all the startups, all the young producers, um, visual arts, performing arts, theater, uh, specialty markets, seasonal markets, all of those kinds of things to share the space. And we will have a curator, programmer, who will be working with us to create annual programs for what happens in this space. It, it, it's unbelievable. It's five stories high, 24 meters wide. It is absolutely extraordinary. And as it said in the video, it has been hiding in plain sight. Some more images. And this, we use this, this was from the construction to show people this space because it's amazing. People would walk by this or drive by this every day and it's as if they had no idea that it was there. And we created this, this framework, and that's as far as we've gotten. We're going to enter into schematic design, design development shortly. And it's all wired by a continuous trail that will connect all these neighborhoods and make the linkages to the waterfront. Two iconic elements, a pedestrian bridge over Fort York Boulevard, which is right in the middle and then an area where we'll have terraces off Strawn Avenue, which is the part on the left, uh, to create a kind of uh, performing arts area. So you see examples of that. This, this is the way we've been introducing it to the public. And some thing like that bridge that you see just above the space was just announced last week. So a whole bunch of external things are coming to actually support the idea. And keep going, ideas of how to use the space. We're going to also tap the stormwater. There's a tremendous amount of stormwater with salt in it that comes off the deck of the expressway and use um, 
plant life and biological process to cleanse the stormwater and create water gardens, part of an environmental strategy. And these are some of the market activities, keep going. And so this, this will be something that Toronto has never seen before and hopefully it will express the zeitgeist of where our city is now by giving all these people in the creative community an opportunity to showcase what they're doing. And so we had to produce some preliminary images. Actually, this is not really designed. This was really something that the press required to give an idea. So here's skating in winter. And that's, that's the terrace that I was talking about at Strawn Avenue. And you can see the trail in the image. And here's a nighttime view. And this is the invitation to the public. So we're gonna create a drop-in center at Fort York and invite people to be part of every stage of the design process. We're gonna do workshops. We're going to engage them in um, every aspect of what we're doing. So I'm gonna end with um, Edmonton and the precursor to the uh, urban design framework, which was the work I did with uh, Peter and Brian Mary and others on the staff uh, a couple of years ago, uh, which was this idea of an urban connectivity framework, which is really part of what the urban design framework is all about. And it was really a way of taking all of the policy documents that had been produced, uh, the way we move, the way we live, the way ahead, capital city downtown plan and finding a way to integrate all of the thinking that was going into those using all the resources of the city and of the various departments. And one of the ideas there was to take all of the things that were happening, including things that are happening right outside these windows, and think of them as chess pieces in this larger game of city building and how could they be woven together to greatest advantage. And so this would have a number of advantages. It would operationalize the downtown plan. It would provide a synthetic overview of land use, built form, public realm, trans mobility, transportation, economic and social factors. It would be a tangible visualization of the future. It would coordinate things and identify opportunities for priority actions and monitoring progress. Next. And so it was based on a series of lenses through which one could look at everything that was going on using uh, the, the capabilities of GIS systems and three-dimensional modeling. Next. And this, this is a zoom into the area that would be just to the east of us, uh, around the quarters, and all the things that were going on at the time. Next. And seeing these not one at a time, but actually what, what was the cumulative result of all of these things in motion within a relatively short period and ultimately producing, if, if this was the existing condition then, taking a land use map, which we usually do as in two dimensions, which you see represented by the colors, but actually showing it in three dimensions, and then next, seeing the outcome of all the various projects coming together, next. And so the, this, this is my final slide. The, the last thing I was asked to do by Peter and Brian when I was working on this with the idea to showing the value of this for the city was the business case. And I, this, this is just a very brief summary of a, of a memo that I did at the time, but I think it's pretty clear from all the things I've shown you um, that there is a tremendous advantage in making a strategic investment in the staff resources and the technology to use the best information systems we have, the depiction systems, the ability to simulate, to show how the city's goals in terms of planning and design are being achieved, that whatever 
the cost would be the payback in improved outcomes, better physical results, economic, social, environmental, uh, would be well worth the effort. So that's, I'm incredibly pleased to see how far this has come since 2013, that a lot of the ideas that we discussed together and worked on at the time have really come to fruition. Thank you very much.